Hey everybody, might be a short meeting since there might be some folks who are out for the US holiday week and there's no agenda items. Um, but we'll see if anyone has uh, agenda items, please add them to the list. Hey everyone. Thank you folks, maybe one more minute to trickle in. Uh, as a reminder, if you're if you're just joining, if you could uh, add your attendance to the uh, meeting notes doc here. All right, why don't we get started? Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, uh, welcome to the Salsa specification uh, SIG meeting. As a reminder, attendance here is agreement to abide by the Lynx Foundation Code of Conduct. And also please uh, sign in in the specification meeting notes, uh, which we just pasted a link in here or salsa.dev slash notes slash spec. That's a quick little redirect. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone has any other agenda items. Uh, Zach, who I think I saw uh, here, uh, asked a question on Slack around salsa source requirements. Um, I know we're planning on deferring that, but um, I'm happy to like, if we just time box that to, to discuss kind of the, the thinking on that. Uh, but in general, we've, we're planning on um, deferring kind of detailed decisions about the source stuff, because there's a whole lot of stuff to do there. Um, and then I could, um, I haven't had, uh, I've been busy with other work, so I haven't been able to make much progress on the 1.0 re rewrite for the requirements. Uh, but I could check in with um, basic thoughts so far. I think there's probably terminology, just general structuring things that um, like high level, like how should we frame them? Uh, that that would be valuable to discuss as a group that I could then incorporate into the into the writing rather than like making it really nice and then someone say oh no that's completely rewrite everything 
Um, so that's that's it on the agenda so far. If anyone else has something, please please add it. Um, Zach, do you want to start start us off with the um, uh, question on the source requirements? I'd love to. Yeah. Um, so we are huge fans of the Salsa framework at GitHub. Um, we have spent a fair amount of time um, figuring out how to support the um, build portions of it. Um, and then the, you know, the way these things go, we sort of like identify a need uh, for like cloud CI/CD platforms. We work with the GitHub Actions team to have them implement support for it. Uh, and then, you know, it goes on their roadmap and they eventually are able to work on it. And then, you know, we can uh, have things like the uh, Salsa province generators uh, be updated. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, we spent a lot of time uh, before, before I did this research last week, I was like, oh, we spent a lot of time talking about build. I haven't really spent that much time thinking about source and how that might tie into, you know, parts of uh, SCM uh, products like GitHub. Uh, and then, you know, maybe I should be talking to teams inside of GitHub to, to figure out what uh, features we should be talking about today that we could implement, you know, in the next three to six months that would eventually be part of some sort of like end-to-end, -end, you know, salsa story. Um, but then, but then doing some research, I, 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 deter, I saw that, you know, very rightly, this group has been very focused on a lot of the uh, complexities around build. So I don't really have a specific request, um, or at least not like one that's not um, particularly timely or urgent. Um, but in general, the way that we were sort of thinking about what this might look like is how would you attest to source properties? Would you literally walk through every commit? Would you potentially walk through all the different code reviews that had happened, you know, looking for certain things? Or would you query like the, the SCM system about what security properties were enabled over a time period and then trust that that SCM platform had correctly implemented those security properties? Um, again, and this isn't a particularly urgent question. I think that having this group focus on builds is the right decision, but that's sort of where uh, we were thinking about things. Yeah, thanks for bringing this. And, and you're right that like we do need to start thinking forward and like there's probably some amount of like just talking through the, just the general idea because I think what we have in the 1, 0.1 spec is not really workable. Um, a, as I mentioned on the Slack thread, um, the, the requirements as stated don't really explain how back far in history. Um, and there's not, at least in my mind, there's not like an obviously good solution. Uh, you could say, okay, well, every single commit needs to be reviewed. Well, then that's just not practical because almost every existing project doesn't have every single commit reviewed. Or if they do, there's no formal record of it. So how do you know? Um, so you can say, okay, well, go back and review every commit or just review, well, that's just not gonna happen. It's, just like, it's, it's not worth the time. Um, Another option could be, okay, well, just have someone review the current state of the code base and attest to that. Maybe that's maybe that's okay, but I think in large code bases, that is again a huge amount of time and probably not worth the effort. And in practice, it's just not going to happen. Um, another option, I think, could say, okay, well, just review the latest commit. The latest commit is just a little diff. And that doesn't really mean a whole lot in, in the grand scheme of things. You could say, okay, the last six months or end months, but then it's like, that feels very arbitrary. And it also has the effect of like, once you enable salsa, then you have to wait six months before you get the checkbox. Like that's, that's no good either. Um, so one alternative that I think is worth considering is, um, well, I guess there's two, as, as I mentioned in the thread, um, that Zach and I had on, on Slack. There's two, I think, properties we want. And sorry, by the way, if there's background noise right here. Um, there's two major properties we want um, for, uh, sorry, is the background noise really, can you hear the background noise? It sounds okay. Yes, meaning it sounds okay, or yes, meaning you can't hear me. Yeah, it's, I, I could barely concentrate. They're, they're doing construction on the, on the other side of this wall and I can't hear it. Um, 
Okay, so maybe Zach, if you want to recap what, what we talked about. Yeah, and then so uh, what what's interesting uh, here is that we've been thinking about how to display um, salsa build properties in the NPM interface, um, and so in that in that vein, we were sort of thinking like, okay, well, how might we also represent source properties? Um, and then you know, one option would be to say uh, we could render in the interface some sort of like concept of how long it has met the salsa. Um, source properties. Um, and then that would be sort of like a hopefully that would be a monotonically increasing number. Uh, and then and then somehow somehow like you know if if there's a release on day one that says that they've been meeting the properties for day one and then there's a release in three months that says they've been meeting the properties for one day then it's sort of like you know the 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 package manager of the registry can kind of flag that as as some sort of like you know anomalous or or unexpected or um, strange behavior. Um, other, otherwise, yeah, we end up in the situation um, that Mark was describing, where if you say, okay, well, I'm not going to use any open source project unless it's been doing um, the salsa uh, source levels for a year, well, we haven't even released to be one of those, so we're we're at least uh, we're at least uh, some length of time out from from that happening, um, and so the the bootstrapping problem is definitely something that we want to consider here. Um, so what, one of the things uh, just also highlight because it, it came up a few times before is a few folks had also brought up like we we want to make sure that um, even though yes Git is by far the most popular um, version control system a few folks had brought up like hey we're not using Git we're using whatever else um, because of legacy reasons or whatever um, and a lot of those also version control systems view a lot of these sorts of things a little bit differently. Um, and so it's something else that we we kind of need to consider to make sure that we're still being relatively generic. Like, I don't think we need to necessarily support every, uh, you know, VCS under the sun, but um, at least, uh, uh, you know, making it clear that it's not just purely like this can only be supported in something like Git is is, is important. Yes, I, I don't always. I don't always remember to, but I try to. I try to remember to frame this in terms of you know VCS, SEM, uh, Cloud CI, CD. We absolutely this is you know something that needs to work for the open source community writ large, not people who are on a specific platform stack. Yeah, and um, I know one of the other things to kind of get into some of the other technical challenges I know we ran into when when looking through some of these things is um, even if you're to cryptographically sort of like, you know, use Git notes or whatever to sort of add information about code review or, or other sort of information directly into the code, anything as simple as uh, like a rebase or reordering of the commits, obviously, sort of invalidates all of that. And it can often become difficult, especially when you have uh, in certain cases like um, like automated tools, like let's say to depend a bot or something like that, that is actually doing the commit on, on your behalf or whatever, um, or certain sorts of commits that are like, hey, this is a commit against, like this is a commit against the readme that just updates a typo. We don't need to have a three-person review or, or whatever, but then it becomes hard to know like, okay, well, um, is, you know, how do you sort of codify that in a way where um, to the user, to the, sorry, to the, um, like to the end user consumer of your salsa provenance, if let's say you're including this information that they know like, oh, actually, yes, this does not have that, this specific change does not have that, but because it's just a change to the readme or something like that, like that. And I know that was one of the, the, some of the other challenges we had when sort of trying to think through this problem. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm, I should have. I should have looked this up before I started this call. But uh, 
again, you know, the, this it depends on what VCS and SCM you're using. Um, but but for this reason, we're we're starting to investigate this idea of like uh, authenticated pushes. So instead of looking at um, individual commits uh, for a Git history that could be rewritten, it's like what user pushed what range of changes or rewrote what part of Git history over like what period of time. Um, but you know, there's no there's no there's no public interaction yet to that to that sort of concept. Yeah, that yeah, I think that's a good idea. The um, when we wrote the original specification, um, we tried to write it in a way that was generic and not say commit, but revision, where the revision could be like a group of commits, um, because I don't think there's a you know unless you have you know you could do sign commits, but really if if unless you're doing sign commits, all you could really tell is the pusher, and then so you just basically can tell the the diff between the the latest push and the previous push, right? Like the, the update in, in Git terminology, the update to the ref. Um, yeah, so something something like that. I think is probably a a, a valuable thing. Um, and I think we should also write this spec in a way that supports multiple implementations. Like one way that uh, I mean, even just not just version control system, but let's even say uh, within Git, um, like one organization or SCM host might do something like uh, have a control be enabled and like you basically can't disable it. And then you kind of have that guarantee that every commit has been reviewed because like it, the infrastructure disables pushes and like it hasn't been disabled between this period. Another one could have some attestations on every single review. Uh, they all if we could clarify exactly what property, like what outcome we're trying to achieve, what's a realistic goal, um, and, and maybe, and I tried to say in the Slack channel, um, I think there's two main goals. One is when initially taking on, choosing to use a package, like either as a dependency or to install it, having some indication that it's safe or good. And there you might want to know like the, the history of how long it's been reviewed. That's like probably one of many different signals. Uh, the OpenSF scorecards project, I think also has a lot of those type of signals. And so maybe we integrate with that or it'll be great. You know, I, I feel like we should align with that, the scorecards there. Um, and then there, the other thing is for updates, once you've already made that decision, you've already determined that I'm going to take on this dependency. Um, you have like, said, whatever the risk is, I accept it. Any future updates, you don't want to increase your risk. So like if all of a sudden a new update doesn't have reviewed code when you were assuming all the things were reviewed, that would be the type of thing I think Salsa can add value to where like scorecards doesn't capture that because scorecards is kind of like in a moment whereas Salsa would be like a harder requirement. Like I'm assuming this and I want that to be true going forward, Mike. So re related kind of going back to some of the things about also like being practical and making sure that we're not, um, you know, saying, hey, you need to have done this since the beginning of history. Um, one of the things I'm just thinking through of what we had done uh, in a previous life at, 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 um, at a hedge fund I used to work at, the the way that they had sort of handled this same sort of problem and we weren't using salsa salt that didn't exist and we weren't using six door six door didn't exist but we were had kind of created some internal tools that were similar one of the things that i think worked well was um one is you don't necessarily need to encode the sign offs directly into the um into like something like Git notes or whatever into the uh, VCS. One of the things that we had done was we actually had a transparency log. And so we recorded, you know, the commit hash plus information directly into the transparency log and it was all signed off and, and whatnot. But the other thing that we did for practicality reasons was one was we sort of said, hey, at a certain standpoint, yes, we went back and did a deep sort of review of the code and then just sort of said, signed off on all the previous commits. Um, and then moving forward, one of the things that that happened was 
individual commits didn't have to get reviewed, but releases had to get reviewed. So if let's say there was five or six or seven commits, when it came time for a security review, great. Like we're gonna we're gonna tag a release or cut a release branch or whatever. And then we would go back and some, you know, um, two security reviewers would review the code diff. And some of that included trivial diffs and whatever else. And then when that happened, cool. Yeah, that, you know, here are all the changes that got made. We're good to go. And then that would get reviewed and then get uh, logged in the, get added to the transparency log. Zach? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, this is such a great discussion. So the, there's there's sort of two different axes I'm thinking on. Um, one is so for the NPM for the salsa um, build requirements, we thought very carefully about what our what our trust boundary was going to be, and we sort of landed on cloud CICD providers and and SigStore. And so you know we we sort of deliberately are saying there that like you can't do an NPM build on your laptop, use SigStore with OAuth. And then say that okay, this is you know this has the same security properties. Um, and so I think I think as we talk more about these source properties, we're going to have the same sort of problem where it's like if if customers have a, a transparency log that they manage on the side, that's fantastic. But it's like how does the how does the community build trust in that? How do we how do we how do we decide sort of what what trust we're delegating to sort of like individual users or, or package builders? Um, and then the other thing I was thinking about is again, kind of contrasting build and source properties. Right now, a lot of the build properties are sort of like binary decisions, like, you know, this was your source repo or it wasn't, or, you know, you built on a cloud platform or you didn't. Um, I, I like the idea of human reviews as a way to sort of like get back to green. If, if you, you know, accidentally land a commit that's not signed, you're like, oh no, everything's ruined. That's terrible. But then as, as soon as we start introducing these human processes, we kind of get out of this, like, you know, I don't want to say black and white, but you know, more, more, more binary representation of, of what these security properties are, and they become more subjective. And I, I, I worry about trying to standardize the behavior of like you know tens, hundreds, or thousands of of humans uh, in that case. Yeah, I, I, I guess one first um, note for the record uh, with the NPM thing that it, like that is the first version right like it's not that six door and github actions is the only thing to be supported but like rather than it's a first thing just for the record um and uh yeah the in terms of like what has um i guess like prior art here i could speak to what google has been doing um we uh you, you're right like boiling it down into um you know, this complicated property of reviewed or not is difficult. And I think it's a lot harder in open source than it is for within a company. And we may need to like split the requirements there. Um, Cause like within a company, you know, well, if it's first party code, you know, all the contributors and you can have like strong authentication and map every account to an individual person on the internet. That's not really possible. Uh, what we tried to do in the source requirements was say like every, or project has a list of trusted persons persons and so two trusted persons should review every commit and or, or revision or whatever you call it um, and in that way to avoid stock puppet things of like one person just creates another account and then reviews their own code effectively um, but within google we have been using um, reviewed as a simple proxy like what what's secure or not is certainly there's a much broader determination than that, but simply knowing that at least two people have been involved in the change uh, is really valuable by itself. And to know that like two, in our case, two employees or two trusted persons, um, like it, it requires it in order to make a change to a production system, it requires at least two people uh, like to, to be collude or compromised or something like that. I think it's a valuable property and it's probably a valuable thing for Salsa to kind of like strive toward both, both not just at the source code, but throughout the um, throughout all the systems, like the build systems as well should should be designed in a way that like that's the kind of property that we're trying to achieve. It's not perfect, but it's it's like a good first step.
Yeah, and I think to build on on top of that a little bit is I think um, to to what you were talking about, Zach, is I think generally you know users are going to want to be able to, especially um, larger organizations are going to want to be able to also say who they trust and and what services they trust and 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 so on. Um, I know when it comes to like different package managers, they're going to want to keep their stuff relatively clean. So they're going to say, hey, these folks are very obviously malicious actors. We're not going to let them in. Um, but yeah, to, to um, also what Mark said, you know, it's kind of hard to know, right? Like I could create five different GitHub accounts and pretend I'm all five different people and, you know, uh, review my own code. But with that said, you know, there's um, one of the things I know we've talked about in the past is something like having a certification or something like that, where somebody can say like a web of trust, where somebody can say, you know, Microsoft trusts this or Google trusts this. And Hey, I trust Google, or here's a third party audit firm that took a look at this project. And they think that, you know, Hey, based on their assessment, they're pretty sure that everybody, they, there's no sock puppet accounts in this project. Um, and then, you know, an organization might say, cool, you know, I'm going to look at that certification and say, okay, now I'm going to take a look at their stuff. I did have a, Mark, I, I tend to agree with the, the value of the two-person review is super important. The one, some of the more advanced scenarios where people do a pull request into somebody else's pull request, does that negate them being one of the two people reviewers is an interesting set of questions that I don't know the answer to or how to figure out the, the problem space. Um, but we have a lot of challenges and I think we have a lot of small people here that can help us with that going forward. Um, for most of the OSS content and so forth, having it gated by a maintainer uh, means that the, the proxy submitters have to go through some bar. For organizations, I think that you kind of have to rely on them vetting the Trojans out of their system. Um, at, at some point, there's gonna have to be a, a claim saying, hey, the auditor looked at this and said, hey, it, it, it meets some bar. Um, but there is always gonna be some uh, set of vetting that has to go on. David? Can't hear you, David, you're muted. Looks like your microphone's not working. You're unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything. He's saying to go on. How about now? Oh, there he is. All right, there's a, there's a separate switch that somehow got moved and I never use that switch. So, okay. Uh, sock puppetry, I was going to comment quickly that sock puppetry is very hard to counter depending on the level of assurance you want to claim. Um, you know, if it's simply that, you know, first, first of all, having a second reviewer, I mean, we've got uh, TAC issue, I think 101, uh, you know, noted the very, very large number of open source projects where there's one maintainer. So having a second person, is an excessive bar for a lot of projects. So let's move up beyond that. Um, if you're going to have multiple people review, more than one person review, well, what's the confidence level that you need to make sure that that's a second person? I think it's much easier within a company. I mean, within Microsoft, within Google, hopefully you can figure out when different employees are actually different employees. Uh, it does become much harder for a straight up open source project, especially since there's a large number of people I think it's a minority, but it is a an important minority who really, really are private people. They do not want their pub, their real names out there for a variety of reasons. And if the only issue is you just want to make sure that they are not sock puppets, I mean, simply having two different accounts, I think for a lot of risk mitigation, that's adequate. If you don't want to go there, then you need to say, well, who can determine whether or not that is? So, uh, so for example, you, yeah. can I ask you a question then? Sure. Do you then think this is represented as a salsa claim that doesn't, it's, it's optional, just data that's there that says, hey, we, there's two persons versus one person review process is just information? Well, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, I'm, I'm inviting this discussion about how strong do you need this assurance to be? I mean, you can simply have the requirement that, hey, it's got to be two people and leave it up to others' judgment of how far. And if you want to make a requirement, well, now we need to be specific about how we want to be. I, I would worry about level three 
you know, hey, we've got to have some sort of independent audit of, of, of that there are two people are actually two separate people. Um, I can imagine that at a, at a higher level. Um, I just, you know, that becomes uh, pretty, co- it's not that it can't be done. I mean, we in the LF actually have a requirement with, uh, for the Linux kernel. But we also don't impose that. I mean, you can't impose that on all open source projects. And we simply impose, hey, I know for sure that somebody knows who you are, not the public does. So you're going to have to trust us that, in fact, they're separate people. It's not something you'd be able to independently vet because they don't want to be known. Some of these people don't want to have their public identities known. No, I know there's a there is a second topic, so I think I think maybe we should yield the floor. It seems like the conclusion that we're coming to is that source salsa properties are complex. Uh, we need to have some more discussions about what they are and what they actually look like in practice. And I think that'll be that'll be sort of part of this ongoing effort. And you know, it's it, we maybe already knew that we we weren't ready yet to come to a definitive conclusion on some of these questions. Yeah, but I, th- I do think it's it's valuable to continue like talking about this periodically, um, because like if we serialize everything, do all the build stuff, then get the source, it's going to be a long time before we're really ready. And so it's probably good to like think about some stuff. You think about it a couple weeks, months later, like oh, I have an idea. Um, yeah, I one one thing I want to mention that or like to put it up for for thought, um, just kind of going forward is, um, can we describe like it could be the case that we just say higher levels like projects, open source projects that can't meet that requirement just never get to that level and that's okay. And it just represents a higher risk level and people who take on that dependency choose to accept that risk level. And that's exactly what the source level is trying to represent is this, this risk level. Um, that could be one solution. Another possible solution could be an alternative to two-party review where we could kind of get at the same risk level because ultimately that's what we're trying to do. I think is is not necessarily two party review is the goal, but that's a means to reducing risk. And if we have some other means of doing that, like maybe post review or other people vetting it, or maybe number of people who are depending on it, or so, I don't know. Um, I could believe that be the case. Nothing comes to mind exactly what that is, but that, that's probably something we could keep in mind as well, David. Yeah, it might be helpful to kind of step back just a little bit. I mean, you have to be careful about, you know, let's step back to the beginning. That's not what I'm drawing, you know, but try to work out some of the threat and, you know, threat and use cases. I do agree. It's totally fair to say, hey, you know, it's not that you can't use it. It's that there's a differentiated threat level. Um, I do think there's a different case between, uh, you know, the, I, I do believe, at least in my experience, that the vast majority of cases, when there's multiple reviewers, they're actually different people. I mean, I'm not going to say it's soccer puck, but it doesn't happen, but it is not the most obvious risk right now. I mean, you know, s- screw ups by people who write bad code is way more common than someone creates sock puppet. And if your threat is malicious nation state actor, Sock puppetry is not actually your bigger problem. There, you know, th- there's a whole organization of a hundred people who are helping to write this malicious code for you. Um, the fact that it has multiple person review is not the solution. So I, I don't want to get to the idea of, oh, look, we vet for sure there's no soft cup puppetry, therefore there's no risk. Uh, yeah, let's go back to the threat model here. If your threat state model is nation state actors, you know, that is not the end. <laughs> In fact, that doesn't really help very much. Although I will say, like, this is nothing is here about like, uh, it's either good or not good, but rather relative difficulty, right? Of like, if it increases the bar, you have to compromise two maintainers instead of one. It, it's an increase, right? It, it increases the attacker's cost, it increases the risk of their detection. Um, so, yeah, that, I feel like for all of Salsa, we should always be thinking in terms of like relative increases as opposed to absolutes. Yeah, Brandon? I'd add that while the sock puppet doesn't seem like an issue now, as soon as you start measuring multiple committers as part of getting your source qualification, that could turn into an issue just because people are trying to achieve that level. Yeah. 
anything more on this topic before we switch? For, for what it's worth, the 1.0 thing, um, well, I don't have much to add. It's just kind of continuing the draft of, of before. But any, any more topics on this, this sort of stuff? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, OK, so I'll just sh share, um, again, just like the current draft of what's I, I had wanted to um, publish this by now, but I just have, unfortunately, I haven't had any time to work on it also this week because I've um, been on my team's rotation. Um, Um, last time I talked, I showed kind of like an idea of like having a table. There were some pros and cons of having getting rid of the checkboxes. I re-added the checkboxes, um, and uh, but tried to kind of collapse it into simple like one row per level. Um, and so, what's in my current draft, based on what the feedback I've gotten so far, is something like this. I haven't finished the table, where like the producer something like this. I don't, I don't love these first two rows. Basically, they define expectations and then use a build process. Some notion of trying to say, like, every single software producer is not writing their own build system. Um, then the build system generates provenance. There's like a level one, two, three. We need to come up with probably better names. Um, and last time, we also mentioned hosted and fully isolated are not good names. We've got to come up with better names. Uh, but something to kind of show the isolation strength. And this also, we also mentioned last time around having like a possible level four column, something like that. Uh, yeah, those are all still noted, but just not implemented yet. And similarly, the packaging ecosystem, we kind of show what they do. Uh, I love the check marks. I, I, I push back slightly on the, hey, you can't create something your own. As long as they meet the requirements, they it's fine. Sorry, the trick yeah. is what the requirements are. You're right. Um, that the emphasis is on we would the expectation is that most people would use a shared build system um but i tried to add language down below of like if you a producer creates their own build system and a, a consumer accepts it then that's totally fine um but just in general it usually looks like this yeah justin yeah um i just want to say i'd be happy to help uh flesh out some of the packaging ecosystem parts of this Great, yeah, and and so this is actually one thing I want to talk about is I tried to um, come up with uh, like who implements salsa that there's the producer, which is the any suggestions on wording are, are helpful and, and again once I publish on the GitHub then we'll have something concrete to talk about um, is the organization that owns and releases the software source control is the infrastructure for managing source code as we just discussed we don't have anything there yet but I want to list it here because eventually we'll add something build system similar. And then a packaging ecosystem, I haven't been able to come up with a better word for it, uh, but I think there's kind of generally three main types of pack, for, for lack of a better word, packaging ecosystems. One would be like a formal packaging distribution system, like, like a language one, like PyPI, the Python package index, uh, an OS specific one, like the Debian project, which produces Debian packages. Uh, or OCI, the Open Container Initiative, is that what it's called? Um, for uh, distributing container images. Uh, like, it could be a formal thing like that. It could be an informal one within a company or an organization. Like, for example, within Google, we have um, this thing called binary authorization for Borg, which we've written a right white paper about. Um, it's not a public thing, but you know, a company could do that. Other companies could do something similar that effectively implements you know, has a convention for how packages are distributed, but it's not like necessarily a formal spec that's public. Um, and I think it also could, and this is part where we're kind of abusing terminology here, but it could be like an ad hoc um, convention, like when like the Tor browser, let's say, uh, distributes their browser over the web or Chrome or actually lo lots of software, and you click a link on a website to download. Effectively, that's like an ad hoc ecosystem, and I and salsa should still be able to be applied there. Um, it's just that the there's no formal ecosystem, um, but it would be good if we could somehow make that fit here, Mike. 
Um, yeah. Uh, so what, one thing um, to add on to the, the the ecosystem piece, I think one of the areas I know that a lot of folks have expressed um, some confusion and concern with is sort of also the intersection between ecosystems. Like, hey, I'm I'm using um, like Red Hat, you know, RPMs to install, uh, you know, Python and some basic Python packages, but then I use pip after that. And there's a lot of confusion as to what does that look like and 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 should those things be even interoperable, you know, or whatever. And like generally, obviously, we want to make sure that a salsa attestation for one package should be the same as as any other package. But I know that sort of thing has has um gotten folks uh, a little confused. Zach. Yeah, I'm 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 a little bit newer to this part of the conversation, but I, I, thinking back to our previous conversation, you know, the the idea is like, can we can we articulate general security capabilities or security properties such that it you know it almost doesn't matter if you are using a language package manager or you know clicking a, a URL to download, and I'm thinking of like this is very off the cup uh, things like integrity checks, like you know the the package manager has some way to determine if the if the package has been modified at rest or like you know uh, uh, in, uh, uh, integrity and in delivery like you know that it's that it's being downloaded over like a TLS connection and you know it's using uh, TLS certificates in order to ensure that there's no like man in the middle attack during the delivery or, or something but like that. You're stepping into the world in which S bombs are meant to solve, right? S bombs we believe are signed and they have the hash of the content. So that's their functionality. So this is where we're kind of bleeding between two different technologies. So we have to be very careful. Here. Well, it, it could be, but that's sort of the point of the of the generic security capabilities that it, it, it isn't prescriptive. So you could Actually, solve that by an MD5 or you could solve that by an SBOM or you could solve that via some other mechanism. Right, but if we're saying open SSF and the community is saying SBOMs for every package, then why are we fighting upstream? Well, should we just not accept it and said that's solved by that problem space and move on? This is where I'm really pushing on. Hey, if we already have to have S bombs and that's the wave of the future, why are we fighting it? I, I don't think. Um, I guess I I kind of half agree and half disagree, Roy. Um, like I'm kind of split here. Um, I agree that it is undesirable to have two different things that are very similar and overlapping. Um, and if we could do it with one, that would be better. Um, where I struggle with is that SBOMs are not designed to solve the same problem. SBOMs are designed for integrity, I'm sorry, for vulnerability management and licensing. And that's like the primary purpose because you want a high signal to noise ratio. Um, like you don't want versus with salsa, we're more worried about tampering where someone is intentionally lying. Um, like if you can't trust the S bomb, then you're hooped to begin with, right? This, uh, yes, I don't, David. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I view these as somewhat different. I mean, Salsa is going in and saying, hey, in order to have you know strong integrity, you need to do X, Y, and Z. No one, to my knowledge, is saying, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm from organization X. I will only accept S bombs if they come in this particular way. I mean, frankly, a lot of organizations are grabbing bags of bits, running analysis tools. Um, you know, sometimes the uh, analysis tools get get it right in a couple cases, and there's your S bomb. And so, you know, the the, the whole notion, you know, it, you, the the S bomb for a lot of folks is a list of dependencies, not necessarily a proof of, of you know, a list of here's how we ensured that we produced it uh, with a certain level of integrity. Look, you may not agree with it. I and I this is where. I'm pushing back saying, hey, we have an intersection between other technologies where, where other groups like VEX and, and so forth here. We have to be cognizant that we're about to overlap between them and we shouldn't try and make it more confusing than it already is. The fact that that all the files in the package have to be listed in the SBOM is it's fundamental because it's called a bill of materials, not 
the dependency graph, right? The dependency stuff is there. So we just, when we have these intersections, because we still have Git bomb out there too, as well, there's places where we're going to intersect. We have to just be crisp and clear. And I, sure. the value of a salsa claim on top of all this, I'm, I'm not against, I'm just being aware that we should take it into account. Oh, totally agree. Uh, who's next? Mike, you want to go? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was just going to add one more thing that I know that is as an additional wrench in there is there is already a lot of, yeah, there is a lot of overlap. And I know we're trying to help out with that, even with the, the positioning group to try and help like integrate more of the folks between the teams, because I know SPDX is pushing, what do they call it? Build info, which is kind of like how you built the thing and where the provenance came from. And then there's also Cycle and DX, I think is calling it formulation. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. It'd be great to be able to say, hey, like, okay, great. Maybe I can include an S bomb as part of the salsa thing and say that's proof of that thing. Um, or, you know, or vice versa, saying, hey, if I have an S bomb, great, I can use a salsa attestation as the the build info or whatever, right? Or some way of linking them. I, I think this is um I think this is a great conversation to have and I would like to resolve it. I do think it goes more in the positioning working group or SIG or whatever we call it. Um, and I think it's orthogonal to the point that was raised. Um, I th I th I'm not sure who brought it, maybe Zach brought it up. Um, that, uh, you know, like around like download, you know, like when you download over the web, you have some tooling or something like that. I think it's orthogonal to like the ecosystem specific thing. So if, um, I say, I suggest that maybe we kind of shelve that for now. Does that sound good to folks, Roy, everyone? Yeah, the, there is a discussion of post-production. What do we do? Like anti-malware scans, are they salsa claims and they, they update? And I'm hedging my bets as in my mind where salsa fits is up to production, the S-bomb then carries off and then we get into VEX and, and additional claims that aren't necessarily salsa. Or maybe they are, and I don't know. I think that's pretty nebulous to me, Mark, at that point, when we transition from, from A to something new. Yeah, I'll think about that, David. Yeah, yeah so just, just to quickly wrap this up, I, I agree with Roy that we want to uh, you know, separate out different technologies to reduce confusion, but, um, and, and hopefully the position folks can do this. I actually had a minor point earlier, Mark, you listed different types of packaging systems, uh, system language ecosystem containers. I would also add virtual machine images. Uh, they have exactly the same kinds of properties. So uh, as, you know, except now there's a kernel in there. So, and, and same challenges. How the heck do you know that that's been generated and with integrity and so on? Yep. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to dismiss Roy's point because um, I think it's very good and important. Um, it's also, I think, really hard. Uh, like one reason why we haven't used, for example, um, like bring us back to the specific specification meeting in terms of formats of like, why don't we just use SPDX or Cyclone DX instead of inventing our own provenance format? Um, I can speak specifically to that, which uh, we, we, there's an issue, GitHub issue about this. Uh, I, I can't talk and find it at the same time. Um, they're not, at least in the current format, they're not a good fit. Like they're really hard to use. Um, like you can't get the data we want and fit it into the existing formats. Um, if we had enough bandwidth, we would sync with them and we would all come up with something that works for all the use cases and that would be great. Uh, it just takes a lot of time. And so I think the route that seems to make sense and everyone seems to be okay with, which is to, for now, we have different formats for different use cases. It's not ideal because like, it's confusing that there's like the salsa provenance and the S-bomb. Um, ideally, once they uh, iron out the kinks, we kind of know the use cases, they get battle tested, uh, and like the rate of change set, slows down, I think we could then maybe try to ideally um, align them. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's, that's kind of what, what, what I was thinking there. 
But I do think the explanation of how they relate is super murky, and that's one thing that the uh, specification, uh, the positioning SIG, uh, should be responsible for. Okay. Um, in in terms of like this kind of coming back to the uh, the the requirements thing. Um, so the, the main idea here is that we, we list who these parties are. There's a producer, the bills doesn't package egos, and, and there'd be consumer row. I just haven't written it yet. Um, and there's basic things that they're doing, like build systems are really doing two things, generating provenance and isolating between builds. They're related, but not quite the same. Uh, and then there's effectively one row per level. And we don't have like multiple rows per level because it just gets too confusing. Um, and effectively, this is like the degree to which this is done, like available, authenticated, non affordable You could just say one, two, and three, but it's giving it a name to give it some more descriptive thing. Although the names we picked, or the names that I used from the previous version aren't, I think could, could be improved. Mark, I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, the packing news space, we're kind of moving away and moving from a world where people install packages either as admin to get it on there, which kind of violates some of what we're trying to do with SSDF and Salsa. Um, do we want to treat install to generate new packages as part of the packaging story, or do you want to treat installation as a separate block? It's unclear to me where it fits. Um, I'm not sure I completely follow. You, I so, think you said, you go ahead, go ahead. So if, if you think of the classical installer for Windows and you're installing to make a container and you install software, you typically have to run as admin, which kind of violates that there's no admin on the box sort of paradigm because it was designed to be a user action of elevated proportions, right? Until we move to here's a, how do you then consider that as part of the packaging system or is it another build step of the package? Michael? We've been doing it as considering it a build step um, as part of the package because we're considering that container to be its own sort of package. And we're sort of saying, hey, anything that gets installed is part of that, the build of that container package. Which means then it's recursive from build the package to build the package again. Sounds good. Um, I think there's also, by the way, um, a difference between, at least in my mind, a difference between you take some inputs and then transform them in some way and then create some output that is then distributed. Um, like if you're creating a container image by doing like installs um, and whatever ecosystem and mash them together and then you have this container image or VM or whatever, and then that gets distributed, that would be a build in the Salsa model. Um, and so the new output thing is a different package than the input ones. Um, there's also the case where like you consider like where it ends up and it gets run, like let's say a service, like in, in a, let's because it's my world, like a cloud platform, uh, or it could be a machine or local machine or something like that, where you get a bunch of things and you run them and then run them on some system that has some sort of permissions uh, like for example, a cloud service account or something like that. Um, that, and like, how do you protect that as a unit, the service account? That's something I would like to also to cover eventually, but I don't think we're there yet of like, cause that's effectively like an aggregate of salsa, but there's no output artifact there. You're kind of like running as a service. Um, that's something like we, we haven't gone into here. I feel like salsa is just about packages of like you transform one, some input packages to an output package. Um, so, uh, anyway, so I had this distribution or this thing, um, some notion of like what the builder must do in terms of formatting. I just want to run as a quick question of like, I thought about like, originally we had this table that looked like this, where like the required, the, the short name is here, a description's here. And then the check boxes over on the right at what level it is. I think that's a little bit hard to read, especially on like mobile or small devices. 
I thought about maybe doing a zippy type of thing where like each row, you know, you could click uh, any, and then you kind of see clearly level one, level two, level three. Any quick feedback on that one way or the other? I have to admit, I actually like the columns, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wasn't trying to read it on a mobile device. I mean, but the, the, the check marks sure made it easy to understand. I, I mean, okay. I think the goal is understandability, though. Right, right. Okay, I'll go back to that then. Yeah, I, I've got to be good? honest. I'm sorry. Oh, David. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to just uh, say, yeah, I much personally much prefer having the information all visible um, without having to uh, click into things. Yeah, I was going to make it default opened, but then it's collapsible. But I kind of like the, the the table still anyway. Okay, thanks. You you might be able to to rig it so that it's it collapses on certain sizes. I mean, yeah, you can, set the, you can set the CSS so that it, it collapses. It's auto open in one and not in the other. That, that's what CSS. I want to do. It requires yeah. some amount of CSS knowledge that I don't currently possess. I, um, I, I yeah, think I, I would I, make it for desktop for now, and then fixing up mobile, we could be a um, future change. Um, I think we're basically out of time. Uh, any last um, comments before we go? Uh, I really like the direction this is going with the kind of like role to class of requirement to requirement, kind of focusing in. Uh, I think it really helps to provide a kind of guided, guided reading of the spec for specific use cases. So I, I, I like the direction you go in this. Would it be valuable for me to like, cause I feel like I keep saying, oh, it's not good enough to publish. I keep doing it. Should I just put on GitHub now, like the current state with like a mess of text and like a bunch of edited stuff? Okay. Yes. All right. I'll just do that. And with a clear comment of like, there's a bunch of garbage text here, but it's at least a half written thing. Yeah. I, I think the, um, like what you did with the provenance one spec where you shared it with all the to do's and we got a bunch of feedback. And at some point we're going to have to say, this is, you know, we've got some kind of consensus this is good enough. Let's, let's merge something, but I'm more than happy to provide uh, feedback on early drafts. All right. Thanks. All right, well, thanks everyone uh, for attending and contributing. I think this was really productive and valuable. Uh, and I'll see everyone next week. And for folks in the US, have a happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Turkey Day. Awesome. I'm going to close this out. It looks like I have the...